Good morning and uh, welcome to the fourth day of this uh, Planetary Defense Conference. It's uh, the last full day with uh, presentations we have today because tomorrow will be dedicated uh, to the exercise. So uh, I guess you, you realize that we are starting a bit early uh, today. We had so many excellent presentations submitted that uh, we had to find some extra time. But I, I think uh, most people are awake enough to get, to get started now. So I would like to make the, uh, the normal announcements. We are still missing a few of the speaker release forms. So I have uh, some blanks uh, left here. And if you have not uh, filled it in, please do so and uh, return them to the uh, reception. Then very important, uh, there are also for the sessions today quite a few uh, presentations missing. Please uh, upload them in the small room, demos, uh, so that we have them available for the, for the sessions uh, of today, if you have not done that, uh, not done that already. And uh, the usual reminder, the session will be uh, broadcast, all presentations, and if you do not want that to happen, please, uh, please let us know. Then we have, uh, in addition, uh, after the presentations today, this banquet, and I think uh, Makoto can say a little bit more. Maybe there are other announcements as well. Please. Okay, good morning. So uh, t t uh, this evening we have uh, this uh, banquet. So the starting time is uh, uh, 7.30 p.m. and two hours. And uh, the place is Grand Nikko Tokyo Daiba Hotel uh, near here, about 10 minutes walk from here. And uh, the room is Paris Royal, A, A. Uh, this is an uh, underground, uh, okay, B1 floor. And uh, the, this conference, all the conference room in, in here uh, will be locked at uh, 18.30, uh, 6.30 p.m. So uh, please uh, move to the uh, Grand Nikko Tokyo Diver before this. And uh, please do not forget this banquet ticket. And the place is uh, here, this one. So uh, now you are here, Mirai Kan, and uh, the uh, uh, Grand Nikko Hotel is here. So uh, you can go just like this. Okay, very near from here. Okay, uh, this is a diver station. This is a, a Fune Museum station. So like this. And uh, the banquet room is. Uh, like this. Uh, this is underground f floor, and uh, 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 this is a, a stage. So first two tables are reserved, okay? But uh, all, the, all other uh, tables are free, so please choose any, any place. And this is a, a self-service style, and uh, here, this table and this table are vegetarian dishes, and other tables are normal dishes. So please choose as you like. Okay, uh, this is the uh, entrance of this uh, of, of this room. Okay, so this is the uh, information about the banquet, and uh, one more thing is uh, uh, just uh, uh, about the uh, bus tour. So uh, if you uh, request a bus tour, please uh, pay the cost. At the, at the registration desk today, and uh, uh, and and also please inform LOC from which hotel you will get on the bus. Okay, that's all. Thank you, uh, Makoto. So with this announcement uh, on the upcoming uh, banquet, where we are all looking very much forward to, we can start uh, session uh, six today. And uh, this session will be on impact uh, consequences. And I hand over to the chairs for this session, which is uh, Mark Boslow and uh, David Morrison. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the impact consequences session. I would like to uh, start with some housekeeping items. Um, these are 15-minute presentations. 
Um, we have our clock over here, so please pay attention to the clock. We have, um, we have it set so that it turns red at, bright red at 12 minutes. So that leaves three minutes for questions and changeover, but you will get a three minute warning and a one minute warning. Now we have a couple of speakers with laptops. So if those of you with your own laptops could come down and start doing your changeover while we're doing the previous question and answer, um, that would help speed things along. Our first speaker is from NASA Ames Research Center, um, Daryl Robertson. Thank you. All right, hi, this is gonna go quick. Uh, so uh, um, ask questions at the end if you like. All right, okay, so um, the basis of what I'm doing is uh, running hydrocode simulations to help validate and calibrate the engineering level models that uh, Lorian Wheeler is running and that um, Donovan Matthias is then using for uh, global risk calculations. Um, as part of that, we looked at the uh, PDC case um, you can see here the swath, uh, nice places to drop the asteroid if you get the choice. Might be Kazakhstan, Gobi Desert, uh, perhaps in the uh, shallow uh, seas, Yellow Sea or the Japan Sea, or perhaps uh, uh, out in the ocean. Um, at the lower end of the size, we're talking about something around maybe 100 megatons. At the larger end, perhaps a gigaton of energy. Okay. Um, so here's a 100 megaton, this is the low end of the energy. Looking at the airburst that comes out from that, um, you can see the energy deposition coming in here as a line. Um, however, even comparing that to like the uh, spherical uh, explosions from like uh, scaled nuclear data or uh, point source, we're getting something pretty similar to that. We're getting 50% uh, fatalities out to about 30 kilometers and we're still breaking windows and stuff uh, about 60 kilometers out. Um, here's the one gigaton case. This is our worst case for the airburst in case we happen to deposit all of the energy in the atmosphere if we come in relatively shallow. Um, these are the points for that. Um, we've got 50% uh, fatalities out to about 60 kilometers and we're still breaking windows about 200 kilometers out. Um, we've got the nuclear data on here, but we also have some other data from Mike Aftemis. Uh, go check out his poster or talk to him. Um, when you get up to the uh, scales that are uh, beyond what nukes um, can do, um, we're uh, having buoyancy effects changing the uh, energy uh, deposition at large distances. Uh, okay, so here we have a uh, land impact into the Gobi Desert. I have two kilometers worth of uh, sandstone on top of granite. Um, okay, so here's our initial uh, impact. Uh, here's the seismic waves propagating through the ground, uh, the entry column, blast wave from the explosion, and then here we have uh, escaping ground waves creating uh, a little bit extra stuff there. Um, we get a uh, central jet form, we have a nice little breaking wave of sandstone, and you can see the, the blast wave propagating out. Um, okay, so if we look at the, uh, the wind, the blast that's coming from that, it's much less than the worst case. Um, in the simulation that I did, I specifically wanted to maximize the energy coupled to the ground. So rather than using a, uh, like a chondrite or something that might break up higher in the atmosphere like you saw in the previous charts, um, in this case it was a one gigaton iron dropped into the ground to maximize the, the, uh, the strength of the uh, resulting earthquake. Um, that then took a lot of energy away from the, uh, the, uh, um, the blast wave in the air, and that's down um, closer to what you saw for the 100 megaton case. So like, you know, 10% of the energy going into that. Um, okay, so um, taking a look at the thermal radiation. So this is like temperature here. You can see the entry column. You can see the, uh, um, the fireball from the resulting ground wave. And then you get this, uh, if you watch this kind of stuff here, this is sort of like what would be like the mushroom, glowing mushroom cloud then moving up in the sky. Um, I took the uh, uh, 3,000 Kelvin contour of that and then um, calculated the uh, heat flux to objects on the ground at different distances. Um, this here is the solar flux, so 50 kilometers away, you've got about the equivalent of 10 suns in the sky. That'll give you a bit of sunburn. Um, on the other hand, if you're only five kilometers away, just outside the impact crater, we have got almost a thousand suns in the sky equivalent, and we are uh, making Libyan desert glass here. Um, um, 
If you uh, integrate that with time, you get your total thermal exposure. And we compared this to the, uh, the, the, the Purdue impact model from the Collins 2005 paper. This here is the canonical uh, efficiency coupling they use of 0.3%. And we get a pretty good match to that. So not a very exciting result, but uh, quite a reassuring one that the model is, uh, the uh, engineering model is fairly reasonable. Uh, we'll skip that one for the sake of time. OK, the earthquake. Um, so here, this is the Tohoku earthquake, um, magnitude 9.1. The further away you go from the center, the less the uh, intensity, or in other words, the damage. Um, if you are uh, really close in and you are getting shaken up and down faster or uh, stronger than uh, the uh, local gravity, uh, stuff on the ground will be flying in the air. Believe it or not, that's pretty devastating. Um, on the other hand, as you get further away, things uh, get a little bit more tolerable. Uh, here goes the earthquake. Uh, this is the data from the simulation. All right, we'll skip out of that one. Oops, too far. Um, so then compared that to uh, the Tune model uh, from 1997, which he got from some um, Swedish data from the 1980s, um, and then also with some more modern um, fits. Um, uh, the, the larger distances off the end here, Tune diverges from the more modern data, but for the distances and the uh, mag intensities that we care about, we get a uh, pretty good match to the tune data. And if we go through the calculation and calculate the coupling efficiency, for this case, I got 0.014%. Depending on exactly how I fit that, I can move that up or down by a factor of like you know, two or three or something. Tune's couple efficiency was 0.01%, so I think that's pretty good, especially given he had an error bar on that of uh, one or two orders of magnitude. Um, this is what happens to you as a function of time. Um, so uh, if you're in the crater, obviously that's pretty bad. Um, if you're outside the crater, you start getting shaking, everything catches fire, and then the blast wave arrives and like blows all the debris away. Uh, 100 kilometers out, you've got a little bit of shaking, you get a bit of sunburn, and then a blast wave arrives. This might be an exciting distance to go watch the show from. Uh, okay, the uh, uh, water impact cases. So I've got here a splash in the, the uh, comparatively shallow waters of the Japan Sea and one right in the deepest part of the Japan Trench. Here goes the deep water impact. And, and again, you can see the, uh, the waves rolling out there. And you can see the oscillations, uh, particularly around here. We get the central jet and cavity oscillating back and forward, pumping out a series of uh, tsunami waves. Let's take a look at that in more detail. Um, so I've stretched the axis. Actually, let's just skip that one. Uh, OK. All right. So here you can see the wave train that has come out. And this is a deep water wave. It is um, dispersing and is a lot less dangerous than the shallow water waves because they uh, decay in amplitude a lot faster than the shallow water waves. Um, and we run that out. And then you see it kind of like decays as it comes up on the shelf. Let's take a quick look at that. Um, all right. So again, uh, close in where we have the deep water wave, we are doing a pretty good job of following the analytical deep water envelope that you might otherwise calculate. And then as we get in close to shore, the bathymetry, the wave just drops down in amplitude. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is relatively hot off the press. I haven't had time to uh, look at the energy analysis of this or to um, compare it to the Boussinesc equations or to rerun at a uh, higher resolution to actually capture the details of the spilling and the breaking of the wave. So take this one with a pinch of salt, but right now this says the uh, continental shelf on the Japan Trench has done a pretty good job of uh, protecting Japan. And this might be something uh, we would be willing to just take the hit on if it is dropping further off the coast. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna hit the Japan Sea. I have 400 meters of water on top of a bit of uh, uh, lime, uh, limestone and then some granite underneath that. Again, you can see the entry and the blast. Um, we've got all sorts of exciting, fun, turbulent dynamics going on in here. Um, OK. Uh, all right. Um, here we go. And we, oh, I skipped that one. All right, OK, this is a bit more like it. So in this case, we have set up a shallow water wave. This wave does not change shape significantly. It does not disperse. 
It does not decay as rapidly as the deep water wave. Uh, this is a lot more dangerous wave. Um, and once we reach the coastline near uh, uh, Fukui, uh, we still have a five meter high, 10 kilometer long wave. Uh, this would be pretty devastating to the coastline on the, uh, uh, all around the Japan Sea. I would not suggest taking that hit. Um, okay, and this just shows you again the, the amplitude again. All right, um, so my conclusions, um, if you could do a precision hit or if it was otherwise going to hit somewhere in the Gobi Desert, you know, there's uh, a few oil wells, a few copper mines, and a whole bunch of dinosaur bones, but uh, otherwise, um, even with a 200 kilometer damage radius, that might be worth taking the hit. Um, obviously, you do not want this landing anywhere near a, uh, a metropolitan area. Um, uh, deep water offshore may be uh, an acceptable location due to the dispersion of the deep water waves will make this a lot less dangerous wave. Um, and uh, uh, you shouldn't uh, let it hit in the, uh, the, any shallow seas because uh, you're then uh, looking at uh, quite a significant uh, tsunami hazard. All right, thank you. Uh, take any questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Galen, right in front. I can't see. Oh, right in front. OK, <laughs> Galen. Um, nice work, Daryl. Thanks uh, for that. Um, um, well, did I hear correctly that, that there's only a hundredth of 1% coupling efficiency into, um, into seismic energy? Yes, that was all we saw. Right. And, um, and, and where does the rest go? Um, most of it goes into vaporization of the uh, asteroid and the, um, uh, the, the rock. So you're, you're spending energy in phase change and converting uh, rock to rock vapor. Right. And good. And, and the second question was, um, on your shallow water impact, um, I, uh, there's a significant disturbance in the, in, in the was it limestone seafloor? Yes. Um, and, and where does that material go? Um, um, rock vapor and a lot of it um, ends up uh, going straight up the entry column um, through due to buoyancy. Basically. Right. Do, does does any of it get hurled ashore in the form of you know sand blasting structures and things um, like that? I don't doubt it would. Yeah. Uh, my resolution is not sufficient to capture that reliably. Um, I mean, okay. uh, I, once you're getting high in the atmosphere, uh, I had one meter resolution on the deck for 150 kilometers out, but um, once you got like 10 kilometers in the air, my resolution was down to 100 meters. You're not going to be capturing uh, debris within that simulation. You would need something else to do that. I think Boris has a question. Uh, please, could you remind the entry angle for PDC 2017? What is the entry angle? Entry angle, uh, these were all done vertically. Um, I believe Galen might talk later on some 3D simulations coming in, but oh, I yes. mean, okay. um, yeah, I, these were all because vertical. It, it will differ drastically from what you uh, delivered um, here. We'll see, from, from what I've we'll seen. We'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned, see Galen's presentation. <laughs> Any more questions? I, I have one question. Sure. So, um, so I couldn't see the time scale, and, and I was trying to figure out what actually was generating that uh, high amplitude deep water wave. And it looked to me like it really was the collapse, mostly the collapse of the cavity. Yes. But it was a pretty large amplitude. And what I'm wondering is if there is uh, also a superimposed on that a pressure driven shallow water wave that you don't really see because the amplitude is a lot lower. Um, th that is plausible. Uh, that might be worth looking at. Anything else? Okay, time's up. Dave says time's up. And our next speaker, yeah, let's thank the speaker. Our next speaker is Eric Stern from NASA Ames Research Center. And hopefully the computer changeover has successfully worked. Work just a bit ago. That was my and I'd read the title, except I don't. <laughs> Very good. Okay, there we We're go. We're there. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the physics of uh, ablation and, and heating during entry, and and uh, how that affects our um, 
uh, our risk predictions. And of course, this is a, I'm representing a, a pretty large group of people that worked on the various aspects of this, and I'm not gonna go through them here, but they're right up there. Uh, so how does uh, ablation and heating, ablation of course just being uh, how much of the object burns up um, during entry, how does that enter into um, the risk predictions? I'm part of the NASA Ames group and you've heard some work um, from them and you'll hear a little bit more. Um, so within our risk code, uh, I showed here the, the equations of motion that, that go into the, the so-called engineering um, uh, airburst code and uh, in particular at the bottom there you see the mass loss equation. Um, so this, this is what determines um, how much of the, the asteroid burns up as it's coming in. Uh, and within that are, are two important parameters to this discussion. Um, those are the heat transfer coefficient um, and the heat of ablation. And just to kind of give you an idea, Lorian's going to go a lot into this in the next talk, but, um, but this is kind of the output of that, is what is the energy deposition rate as a function of altitude. Um, so as it pertains to this discussion, those heat transfer coefficients and ablation, uh, the nominal values that, that are um, in the literature for that are typically assumed to be 0 0.1 and 8 megajoules per kilogram. This encompasses uh, tons and tons of physics, obviously, so um, there's already kind of reason to be a little bit incredulous about such a simple model, but um, such as it is. Uh, so the, the work that I'm doing within the entry modeling group uh, primarily is focused on, on refining our uh, models um, uh, for this. So um, I'm going to talk uh, first about uh, heating and, and the way that we go about doing that is, is we're trying to leverage um, kind of our so-called high fidelity computational fluid dynamics and other modeling tools that we use for entry modeling for spacecraft and apply that to, to asteroid entry. Um, and here's some of the, the types of phenomenon that, that, that we focus on within this group. Um, so for asteroid entry, uh, you have enormous amounts of radiation more than you would have uh, for a typical spacecraft entry because of the size of the object and the velocity and how deep it penetrates into the atmosphere. So radiation is a really big part of the portfolio. Uh, in addition to that, um, these things lose tons and tons of mass. Chelly Vinsk may, maybe lost 90% of its mass um, during entry, for example. So tons of ablation, uh, much more again than, than we're accustomed to dealing with. And the main source of that is, is through vaporization. In addition to that, and we'll see a little bit of this fairly soon, uh, is the flow of melted material also being responsible for a great deal of mass loss. And to, to tease maybe what would be in PDC-19, um, we're also looking at, at how these ablation products uh, interact with the hot flow as they move downstream, and that's really responsible for a lot of the light production um, that we observe. So that's kind of an uh, area of ongoing work. But for the current discussion, we're going to kind of focus on um, this, uh, the front region of this incoming spherical asteroid. Um, and the, the results I'm going to show um, with respect to heating are um, the output of very, very detailed uh, calculations, which include um, the ablation products uh, interacting with the ionized uh, air in front of, in front of the object. Uh, so you can see here just, the, you know, you don't have to digest a lot of the details of this, but um, this is the temperature uh, with a fully coupled simulation here on the top, and you see that the shock wave uh, which is the, the sharp interface on the right, has been pushed out far away from the body because of uh, the presence of, of the ablation products. On the bottom, you see all of these uh, uh, more exotic um, metallic species that are being injected in the flow, and uh, those uh, interact strongly uh, with the radiation signal that the, the asteroid is receiving. Um, and so when we, there, there's a lot more detail here in this paper um, that you see uh, cited on the bottom. Um, but, and I'm of course very happy to talk about this uh, uh, offline, but when you, when you take all of these results from, from uh, dozens and dozens of simulations, uh, we can derive a new heat transfer um, coefficient. And so, as I mentioned at the introduction, um, the typical used value for this is 0 0.1. Um, that uh, dates back quite a while. And, and actually, if you, if you do uncoupled analysis, meaning you just run the CFD, and then you try and post-process it and compute the heating, uh, you end up with a heat transfer coefficient that's around there. Now, here you see if you include all of these effects, the ablation, um, 
which uh, produces all those species near the wall, those actually block the radiation to the surface uh, significantly. Um, and once you include all of this physics, you actually knock down this heat transfer coefficient um, by uh, up to two orders of magnitude, um, practically in some cases. And relevant to us is the trend here um, is as you move down, or sorry, as you uh, increase in size or you decrease in altitude, um, the tendency is to have that attenuation be greater. So uh, of course, increasing size and decreasing altitude uh, are two trends that are particularly relevant for for the planetary application or planetary defense um, application. Uh, so now um, move on to, to how we're, uh, some ways in which we're trying to refine uh, the denominator in that uh, equation I showed earlier, that being um, the, the so-called heat of ablation. So we've been, we've been doing some experiments uh, both to, to give us some uh, data to validate our numerical tools as well as just to give us some insight. This is a pretty unfamiliar um, uh, problem space that we're, that we're operating in, and so uh, just getting some um, observations of, of what the relevant physical phenomenon here is, is of some value. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two different experiments um, here in the next few slides. Uh, the first one uh, is a continuous wave laser experiment, so we used an Air Force uh, asset uh, to expose some uh, samples of ordinary chondrite to uh, heat fluxes uh, ranging from, from 5 to 20 kilowatts. You can see here in the figure um, our little uh, uh, sample of chondrite that's, that's in this vise, um, and the green uh, arrow here representing uh, the incoming laser spot. So these heat fluxes are actually uh, allow us to get to, to relevant um, entry conditions just in terms of the heating uh, anyway. Um, and also uh, has the nice aspect that this is radiation, which is the dominant source of heating during entry. So this is a, a fun little movie from, from that experiment. This is, again, that H5 chondrite that's, that's being exposed. Uh, that, that circle indicates where the, the laser spot is hitting it. This is at 5 kilowatts per centimeter squared. Um, and you can see uh, basically the surface of this thing boiling. Um, and producing uh, this thick vapor as well as some soot probably um, and ejecting uh, a lot of molten um, particles away from the surface. So this is kind of our first look at, at, at probably if you could peer through this intense radiation as this thing came in, this is uh, a little peek at what the, the surface may look like um, while it's ablating. Um, quantitatively from this, uh, we, can, we can plot the heat of ablation from this experiment against uh, that canonical value of 8 megajoules per kilogram. And what we see is that lower heat fluxes, uh, we actually somewhat surprisingly um, lay on top of that. I, I would suspect some of that is a bit of a coincidence, but, um, but nevertheless, we're, we're near uh, that value. Um, with increasing heat flux, the, the ablative efficiency tends to drop off a little bit. Um, we've attributed a, a, a good part of that to um, that blockage from the ablation products that I mentioned. Um, just a bit ago, and when you look at the video from the higher heat fluxes, uh, you have a much more intense plume and much more opaque plume. Um, so now I'm going to move on and, and uh, talk about another experiment that we did fairly recently. Uh, this was using the ArcJet um, facility at NASA Ames, so this is like a high uh, energy wind tunnel. Um, it allows us to achieve uh, reentry conditions at least relevant to spacecraft. Um, and for this one, we, we were kind of operating at max conditions allowed us to get to about four kilowatts per centimeter squared, which is, is on the low end in terms of, of uh, asteroid entry relevance. Um, I, I put kind of a, a quote there as far as 30 meters, 20 kilometers a second, 60 kil kilometers altitude. So we're a bit high up in the atmosphere. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, it, it allows us to study some other phenomenon because we have a high energy flow as we would in the real case. And so we can produce, emission, we can produce light emission where we can't in a laser experiment. Um, in addition to that, we, we have these precision machine models which actually allow us to get very uh, quality uh, uh, quantitative data for, for developing and validating um, our models. And so uh, you see here the, the model design that we had, the flow. Uh, when I show the movie here in a second, is going to come in from the left uh, and cause it to ablate um, pretty excitingly, as, as you'll see in just a moment. Uh, again, we're using a, uh, the TomDoc H5 uh, ordinary chondrite as our um, test article. And so this is what uh, it looks like in uh, 2,000 frames per second. Um, so this is, again, that, that kind of conical model. This is about midway. Um, 
uh, through the exposure time. The total test time was about two seconds, so this, this goes by in the blink of an eye. Um, and this, probably this little segment of video is, is maybe a tenth of a second. Um, and so, you know, what you see here obviously is just melt everywhere. Um, this thing flows down like a faucet. Uh, you can also see this, this is actually in true color, um, and you see this yellow uh, vapor kind of flowing downstream. Um, I didn't have time to go into the, the spectrum in this, uh, um, in this presentation, but um, that yellow is, is very well borne out in what we took optically. Um, so this really taught us, told us a little bit about some of the other phenomenon that we're really going to have to model, which, you know, this, this is obviously a very dynamic uh, process that's going on. Again, uh, I show here a comparison from this experiment to our canonical um, 8 megajoules per kilogram value. Uh, for this experiment now, we're, we've, we've dipped quite a bit below. This shows versus time the evolution of that heat of ablation, um, and, uh, and we see that, that after this transient heating process, that's the, the, the high heat of ablation that you see on the left, it levels out to a value a little bit below two megajoules per kilogram. Um, this is actually quoted by OPIC um, in the very early literature as being kind of the characteristic heat of ablation of melt. Um, and, and the reason it's much lower than the eight megajoules that we see is we're, we're clearly in a melt um, dominated uh, regime. And so it's, it's actually shedding heat a lot more efficiently um, than when you actually try to vaporize uh, some rock. So how does this actually uh, affect our, our predictions of, of risk? So like I said, we had our nominal values there. Um, through uh, the research that we've done in this project, we've kind of evolved those values a little bit. Uh, you see the new ranges here. Our heat transfer coefficient has gone way, way down based on the analysis that we've done. Um, and then we've identified these two regimes of, of uh, heat of ablation, a low heat of ablation characteristic of a melt dominated regime and a high one uh, characteristic of a, a vaporization dominated. Um, and now we can run uh, uh, our FCM code that Lorian is going to talk about um, for a range of those parameters and see what it does to a, a, a relevant entry case. So this is a 100 meter diameter 83 megaton case and, and the trend as you would probably guess is uh, as the ablation parameter goes down, meaning less ablation, um, the asteroid penetrates deeper into the atmosphere before air bursting. So you get a lower altitude air burst, more risky um, in terms of the ground damage footprint. And just to, to run it for a range of cases here, um, you see with increasing size, of course, the air burst height goes down. And then across our range of, of ablation parameters that, that we're working on, um, you see that the uh, the difference in air burst height can vary by um, up to nine kilometers for the cases here in this figure. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of what that uh, means for damage on the ground, um, a nine ki for the 100 meter impactor case, which is more relevant to planetary defense, that nine kilometer height difference would correspond to an increase in 25 uh, kilometers in, in terms of the four PSI blast radius. So, um, so not insignificant, um, and so this is why we're, we're we're looking into this phenomenon a little um, more. So uh, I'll kind of skip over the conclusions and the acknowledgments and, uh, and move on, and hopefully there's some questions. Thanks. Thank you, Eric Cobb. Do we have any questions? And wave your hand, because I have a hard time seeing it. It's a little dark in here, if you have questions. Um, so I have a question. So you said, um, the, uh, when you reduce the parameter, the altitude of peak energy deposition is lower because basically you're bringing mass lower and that increases the risk. Now that would be true, I think, if you've gone below the, uh, or if you're well above the altitude of, of uh, uh, optimal burst height. Um, but if it's a different size, you may go below the optimal burst height and then you've actually reduced the risk. Would that yeah. be correct? The, I, I, yeah, I suppose that, that would be correct. I kinda, I was, for, this, for what I've done so far, I've kind of been focusing on smaller ones. And so, you know, the, right. you're almost right at the threshold of, of not causing any ground damage footprint sure. at all. But yeah, once you go up to higher ones, I guess you could, you could pass through the optimal. So when you um, do the ensemble risk, and this probably isn't a question for you, some of them are have increased risk, some would, have, some would have reduced risk, but on ensemble, there's a net increase or reduction, and sure, I'm not yeah. sure which way that would go. Yeah, I would have to defer to, to Donovan on that question, but, uh, but yeah, I can see your point. Okay, we've got a question here. <laughs> yes. 
Okay, excellent work. So, but the, my question is that the reality for the atmospheric reentry must be simulated uh, to change the, the atmospheric density with time, or so your arc heating wind tunnel can be changed the heating rate with time. Um, we would not typically do that. Uh, I, there's been some proposals to do that with spacecraft to actually fly a trajectory in the arc jet, but. Um, but I think we have enough to chew on <laughs> for now because we can't really replicate the entry environment for an asteroid. We could probably for a meteor um, type application, but uh, for this, we're just gonna use this testing to, to kind of isolate physics that we wanna study. Thank you, Thank you Eric. <laughs> and we have another uh, computer changeover, so there's gonna be a little pause here. Um, and our next speaker is Lorian Wheeler. Um, she's also from NASA Ames Research Center. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Lorian Wheeler, and I work on the Asteroid Threat Assessment Project at Ames, along with Donovan Mathias and a number of our other colleagues here today. And I am going to talk to you about our energy deposition modeling for asteroids with varied structures and show some preliminary results for our matches to the Chelyabinsk meteor. So our group has a probabilistic asteroid impact risk model, which we use to assess the potential threat of asteroids of various sizes and classes in a statistical sense. Um, and Donovan Mathias is gonna talk more about that later this morning, so stay tuned for those details. But as part of that work, we are developing what we call a fragment cloud model, which models the energy that the asteroid deposits in the atmosphere during uh, breakup and descent. Um, those energy deposition results are then used to estimate air burst altitudes and the resulting ground damage in our risk model. Uh, the, FCM, the FCM results can also be used to match um, observed meteor light curves, and that allows us to make some inferences about potential pre-entry properties of the asteroid and also to investigate different breakup mechanisms or guide modeling refinements as we go. Um, of course, different asteroids with different structures may deposit their energy very differently as they break up, and so our current effort is expanding FCM in order to represent varied internal asteroid structures. So here is a diagram of our FCM approach. Uh, the basic premise behind the model is that it represents the breakup process using a combination of both discrete fragments and aggregate debris clouds. Uh, most analytic fragmentation models tend to use either purely one approach or the other, and we've combined them in order to represent the distinct behaviors of both the larger, more predominant fragments, and then also the more aggregate behavior of the smaller debris. Uh, the asteroid and all of its components, uh, their, their motion and ablation is integrated using the standard meteoritics equations that you see above. Um, and when the, air, uh, the stagnation pressure on a given fragment exceeds the aerodynamic strength, the object fragments, it breaks into a given number of child fragments and then also a debris cloud of the remaining mass. Each of the child fragments, the strength is increased according to a Weibull-like size strength scaling parameter, and the rate of that increase is controlled by this uh, alpha exponent here. Uh, each of them then continue independent descent until their strength is again exceeded, and they break again into another subset of fragments and another debris cloud. Uh, the debris clouds are modeled using the pancake approach of Hills and Gota, and they spread and slow fairly rapidly under a common bow shock. Uh, their spread rate is determined by this dispersion velocity equation down here, which depends upon the density of the material and this uh, constant dispersion coefficient. Uh, all of the um, different components continue flight until they either ablate completely or hit the ground. Um, and including both the debris and the fragment components then allows us to represent different initial asteroid structures. We can seed it with, as a, rub a rubble pile with different groups of fragments of various sizes, 
or we can have a monolith, we can have an outer layer of regolith, um, so we can run a, different, a bunch of different structures and see how those turn out. And then the end, the end result of the model is the energy deposition profile, which represents the amount of energy deposited in the atmosphere during descent as a function of altitude. And that's generally expressed in kilotons per kilometer. Uh, the plot on the top shows a sort of general energy deposition curve. Um, the black line is the total energy deposition, and the blue line shows the, the uh, contribution of the cloud components. And the red line shows the contribution of the fragments. As you can see, the clouds do most of the energy deposition, but the fragments have the important function of distributing where the different cloud masses are released during the breakup. Uh, the bottom plot shows the energy deposition of the different cloud generations that are released along the way. The larger initial clouds uh, tend to deposit uh, and their energy more gradually and make these big, broad, deposition curves, while the smaller clouds that are released in denser atmosphere can make these sharper spikes. So when we combine that approach with varied asteroid structures, we can get a nice fit to a variety of energy deposition curves from observed meteors and produce a variety of flares and features. Over here we have some sample fits to the Beneshov and Koshisei meteors, which are on the smaller four and one uh, meter diameter sizes, and on the right we have a fit to the Chelyabinsk meteor, which is our focus today. Uh, so when we model the Chelyabinsk meteor, we started with the initial entry and mass properties from the Popova 2013 paper. Um, we then varied the FCM inputs and compared those to the energy deposition profile from the observed light curve um, from the Brown et al. 2013 paper. And the FCM inputs, they are, they're set as inputs in the beginning. We don't vary them along the course of, of the descent in order to match the curve. We just set them, they go, and then we get our result. Um, for these matches, the parameters we varied include the initial rubble pile fragments, the aerodynamic strengths, the numbers and mass distributions of the child fragments produced, the cloud mass per break, the strength scaling alpha, the ablation coefficient sigma here, and the dispersion coefficient of the clouds. Um, so, when we, make, when we make these matches, one of the things we're able to do is in make some inferences about the pre-entry properties. For example, we found that in a variety of our matches, when we use the meteoritic density estimated from Popova, the 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter, our curves consistently overestimated the peak energy deposition by about 50%, and that's easier to see here down on linear scale than on log scale. Um, when we lowered the mass and the bulk density, we got a better match when we lowered it down to about 2.2 to 2.6 grams per cc. And when we compare that to the meteoritic density, that gives us a macro porosity range about 20 to 30 uh, percent, and that's consistent with a moderately fractured body or uh, a sort of compact rubble pile. We can also look at how the different structures and breakup mechanisms can reproduce different specific flare features. Uh, we were able to match all three of the, these flares using either a rubble pile configuration or a monolith with a, um, an outer regolith layer to get this little upper puff. Uh, the rubble pile configuration where we can put in more specific fragment sizes and strengths matched a bit better, but we were able to match it either way. So looking at the specific flares, the little upper puff was well matched by a uh, debris cloud of a few, percent, a few tenths of a percent of the initial mass. It wasn't, wasn't as well reproduced by the uh, shedding of little tiny fragments along the way. The main flare was a catastrophic success of fragmentation, about 95% of the initial mass uh, beginning to break up at around uh, one and a half megapascals. And in order to get the nice, broad, smooth flare, pro flare profile, we needed to use a fairly high fraction of the mass going into the clouds at each break, between 75 and 85 percent. The lower flare, as I said, we, uh, we could reproduce either using stronger initial fragments from the rubble pile or using successive fragmentation from the main breakup uh, persisting below the main flare. Uh, it consisted of about 2.5% of the initial mass, breaking up at about 15.5 megapascals. 
And um, in order to get that second peak from a successive fragmentation, we needed to use a fairly high strength scaling alpha coefficient of about 0.3 to 0.5. Um, when we did that, it was also fairly sensitive to the mass splits we used for the different child fragments. They needed to be not quite even, but you know, within a few percent of each other to get that flare neither merging with the, the main flare or breaking up into a lot of different flares. Uh, another thing we can look at, aside from the energy deposition, is the amount of landed mass. And while we don't specifically use this model to replicate strewn fields or landed mass, it is a nice sanity check to see how we are doing. Um, we're getting estimates within, you know, within a reasonable range of estimates from the Popova paper around 5,000 to 6,500 kilograms compared to the 4,000 to 6,000 estimated in Popova from the fallen masses. Um, this also helps us constrain uh, the most plausible cases. If we can get multiple fits, some of them may look good in the energy deposition, but you know have way too much fallen mass. So it's a nice way to sort of subselect the better matches. Um, another thing we were able to do is use these matches to refine our modeling parameters. For example, one of the things we found is that we needed to reduce the dispersion coefficient and or the ablation parameter on the clouds in order to get a better match of the, the width. When we used the baseline values um, for those, which was 3.5 for the dispersion coefficient and 1e negative 8 kilograms per joule, for the ablation coefficient, we got a much narrower peak, and we were able to broaden that out and bring it down by reducing the dispersion coefficient to closer to one and a half or two and a half, and reducing the ablation coefficient by you know a factor of two. So, in summary, we're able to uh, use our model to get uh, good matches to observed meteor light curves and represent different asteroid structures. Uh, bringing that back to risk assessment applications, um, it gives us an approach that's both efficient enough to run the very large numbers of cases we need to do for probabilistic assessment, while also being variable enough to represent asteroid, different asteroid structures. Uh, it also sort of opens the door for being able to move away from the typical point source airburst es uh, estimates and incorporate some of the variety of energy deposition rates and how that might translate into different ground damage. Um, so moving forward, um, we have a bunch of interesting stuff to work on. We're working on initializing our rubble pile using Infra's power law distributions and um, also doing more comparisons with higher fidelity simulations from, for example, Daryl Robertson and Michael Aftismas. So I'm gonna stop there and take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Lorian? Boris. Uh, I made some papers, for, in, for instance, by Svetsov and Kotors, that uh, they argued that uh, the shock front bow shock is unstable and uh, it works like a jackhammer. So originally, monolith body could be uh, as a rubble pile in the process of entry. I think that uh, this situation will bring you even more uh, possibilities and options for this, uh, I think that we didn't consider this, I have seen it, but if you consider this, that will be a more broad scope of possible scenario. It's not, it's not a question, it's okay. just a... <laughs> I, I, we had another question here too. So thank Boris, you for that. Yeah. So, so does um, rotation of the object or uh, shape, like elongation, play any role in energy deposition? Um, it may, we don't look at that um, because we are mostly looking at aggregate risk. That's not a level of detail um, that's probably going to be relevant compared to some of the larger driving sources. So we have not looked at that. Anything else? One more question? Thank you, Lorian. So uh, next up speaking is my co-chair, David Morrison, also from the NASA Ames Research Center, and he's setting his own clock. Why are you giving yourself <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to summarize for you the results of a workshop 
that we held last summer, jointly sponsored by NASA and NOAA, the National Atmospheric and Ocean Administration, and addressed very specifically to what I have always felt was a big gap in our understanding, and that is the hazard, the risk associated with tsunami for impacts in the ocean. Um, it's also something that uh, you can tell from the comments of the press here is of great interest here in Japan for good reasons. It's also beloved by Hollywood. Those of you who remember the movie Meteor or the movie, or deep, movie Deep Impact see immense waves crashing over New York or Hong Kong. And it has often even been said that if a large impact took place in the middle of the Atlantic or the Pacific, that the tsunami waves could be a threat to large parts of the coastal areas surrounding those oceans. We wanted to see if that was true. So we had a two-day workshop, and I'm simply going to summarize some of the results of it. Almost everyone who participated in the workshop is here. Almost every one of you has done more work since the workshop last August, so I expect that everyone will hear contradictory results and improved results, and I have not tried to keep up. I'm simply talking with what we know that was reported at the workshop. Before I begin this summary, let me take a moment to say something that I think everybody here knows, but you may sometimes forget, that there's quite a difference between the problem of calculating the and understanding the effects of an individual impact and assessing the ensemble risk. And we're seeing that in our exercise. As we began with a huge risk corridor with very uncertain parameters for the asteroid, it's something like an ensemble risk. You sum up all these different possibilities, you do Monte Carlo calculations, you look at the distribution of populations that would be affected, and this on a global scale can lead you to an ensemble risk. The situation is clearly different when you have a specific object with a known size, shape, entry conditions, and now you have to do much more accurate calculations because you want to know what will really happen. Uh, and if it should hit at Tokyo or a little offshore or a long way offshore, those are the kinds of things you would analyze for an individual object, but they don't really enter into the ensemble hazard. Our workshop dealt with mo both, but the focus was on the ensemble hazard. The first, first of the three sessions uh, was to model a tsunami pot producing potential of airbursts and direct water impacts. In other words, how do you form the wave? Um, and we were dealing with specific examples. The hope was that the people at the workshop would look at the same parameters and see if their computational codes re yielded the same results. That was kind of successful, but not in every case. And, uh, but generally, there did not seem to be a large divergence in the codes, although perhaps when uh, Mark talks after me, he will have a different opinion on that. Um, so everybody used energies of 5, 10, 5, 100, and 250 megatons, which is roughly diameters of 50, 125, and 180, although I think we all realize that uh, those sizes are not a very good measure without additional information of the energy. And the conclusion was that air bursts were much less effective in generating water waves, uh, and that in general, for both air bursts and impacts into the ocean, the waves did not propagate very great distances. There are a number of things here. There's the geometry of the way the wave is produced, a circular point source instead of a long linear source, which is typical for seismic. Uh, there was a great deal of turbulence indicated in that area, and indeed, uh, it was a conclusion of the people who tried to make damage in their models that it was actually quite hard to create a tsunami that would do damage on the ground if, unless the impact were hundreds of kilometers or at least tens of kilometers away from the shore. The second panel started from the input of the first and, started, and studied the propagation the formation of the wave and its propagation, which is a more difficult task, 
because it depends so much, not just on the properties of the original wave that's generated, but the bathymetry all along the path between there and the land, possible focusing effects, changes in the slope underneath, and it, in some ways we were not ever successful in really comparing apples with apples. But we did look at some specific cases. The, uh, the South China Sea, which we talked about two years ago, the city of Westport on the coast of Washington, and the Long Beach area in Southern California. Again, it was not easy to produce inundation if there is any sort of barrier. Westport has a four meter sea slope of land, and no matter how hard people tried, it was very hard to get a tsunami that would top that four meter barrier with the codes that were being used, which are not super high resolution. Um, Long Beach is more of a danger. Some of you have seen it. It's a very gentle slope, but it has a big seawall around it. And now we're getting to areas of focus of trying to understand how the wave goes around a seawall or whether it doesn't. But the consensus remained that under most circumstances, the waves that have been generated by the first group will not propagate for the kind of distances of hundreds of thousands of kilometers that seismic tsunamis will. Hawaii can be impacted slightly by any, any earthquake in the Aleutians or in Japan, uh, but an impact in those areas of any of the sizes we're talking about, up to a gigaton, uh, would not cause a hazard. Maybe you'd have a one meter or 10 centimeter wave, and it might even damage small boats in a boat harbor, as at Westport, but it wouldn't be a serious risk of casualties. The third session, continuation, looked more at what happens when the waves strike the shore. And this is even more complicated because now you have to not only know the configuration of the slope coming up to the shore, but the distribution of population and of infrastructure. So all we could do was look at a couple of individual cases and very hard to extrapolate. Uh, the cases that were looked at in detail uh, were Westport, and Long Beach, and as before, all the panelists concluded that the damage was largely confined to the shore. One way of thinking of this is that the waves, the tsunami waves generated by an impact, although they may have a fairly high amplitude, have a shorter wavelength, and there's simply less water moving in any one wave. Very different from what we have seen in these amazing videos from the Tohoku wave, where it just keeps coming up and up and up and up, and then it turns around and goes back, sweeping all sorts of things out to sea again, and then it comes up again. Uh, these, even if they're fairly high waves, just don't do a great deal of damage. The ensemble risk we'll be hearing more about toward the end of this session. In some ways, that was our most interesting problem because we were trying to provide data that would be useful to the NASA science definition team that's been leading these last two years to try understanding what kind, that is, what sizes of NEOs we should concentrate on finding and tracking. And the issue here is simply what are the total populations averaged over the whole world uh, that are affected by or killed by or have infrastructure destroyed by the waves. And the conclusions were very interesting and the most important result here. First, below 200 meters, that's already bigger than the 140 meter that's in the, uh, in the goal to NASA and others to, to find the objects. At up to 200 meters, it was just very difficult to create a situation where a tsunami created significant risk to human populations and infrastructure, even if there was a small inundation. Um, a larger than 300 meters, there is a real risk from tsunami. It's mostly associated with impacts into the water, not air bursts. Um, but when we ran through the calculations, we saw an order of magnitude lower damage risk hazard from tsunami. Well, summed over all the conditions around the world than from land impacts. Now, larger than 500 meters, you begin to get into cases where global effects matter, and this workshop did not consider 
global effects, either for their, uh, the, the earthquakes, the climate changes, the kind of thing we all know about from the KT impact of 65 million years ago, if you remember far, that far back, as sometimes I think I do. Uh, so, the summary, we believe, although there were many differences, and uh, there are a lot of details left out, that stepping back and looking at the whole thing, we were quite successful in achieving our primary goal of reevaluating the tsunami risk for objects less than 250 meters, and uh, providing a better estimate, in particular, of the ensemble risk. I should note in all of this, we are very grateful for and dependent on the work of, uh, of Al Harris, and much of the apparent decrease in the total hazard for both land in impacts and water impacts is due to the decreasing numbers that are estimated for the asteroids out there. So very frequently now, when you go through ensemble risk analysis, you find there really are not many casualties. In particular, uh, the conclusion of the group in our third panel was that the total ensemble risk for everything is of order of one casualty, or 10 casualties per year for the whole world, which is, of course, totally negligible to the other things, including your danger of being run over by a car when you walk out, out of this building. Uh, and so we need to understand that. We need to be careful in how we characterize, especially to our colleagues and to the press, what the risk is. Why are we caring about something that creates so few annual casualties? Well, there are very few annual casualties because there are very few annual events. Nevertheless, as we all here know and as we study in our exercises, there's always the possibility of a truly catastrophic happening of a scale greater than any other that we can think of. Perhaps a supervolcano eruption would come close. So we have to understand in communicating with people, we're studying this because it is possible that there could be an exceptional event not because it's a daily or monthly or yearly or even every century occurrence. Within that context, the risk is still very much dominated by land impacts. These shore impacts can be important if they're very close to shore, but actually the blast wave from such an impact a few kilometers offshore probably does more damage than the wave. But we'll hear from Galen Gessler and others as this session goes on. Uh, I'm sure there are improvements that could be made. I don't think they'll change the qualitative answer that tsunami caused by asteroid impacts below 200 meter, 300 meters diameter are not, as, not nearly as much. They are down at least an order of magnitude from the level at which we thought a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, we have time for a question or two. Ah, uh, Alan. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have the rare distinction of having lived very close to both of your principal study areas. And um, uh, with regard to the northern one up in Washington, uh, as you go up the Pacific coast, the amplitude of the diurnal tidal wave gets larger and larger, and that region, as my recollection, is about 10 feet average from high to low tide. Uh, obviously, there would be a substantial difference in when a tsunami might come in. If you had a two-meter uh, wave come in at low tide, it wouldn't even make it up to where the tide will be in six hours. Uh, was any of that kind of considered to see if a, a tidal wave at high, high tide might be more damaging? No, uh, that, that really was far too granular for what we were doing. That is a good example of the difference between how you would react if you actually had a wave predicted headed for Westport or here or anywhere else compared to trying to estimate overall hazard. Anything else? Okay, no more time. And I'm next, so thank you.
Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Mark Boslow uh, of Sandia, who is also about to become self-employed, uh, who has been one of the most important contributors to this whole thing in understanding Tunguska and other kinds of uh, impacts. And I love your picture. <laughs> I, I, I stole this from my um, co-author, Vasily Titov. This was his cover for his presentation at the um, Asteroid Generated Tsunami Workshop at NOAA, where he is employed um, in Seattle last summer. Um, and so I'll state up front that it's not a 100% consensus, uh, the, the summary that David just read. Um, and Vasily and I are uh, the two um, dissenters from that consensus. We're, we're not 100% uh, dissenters. We uh, agree with some of the conclusions, but we do not think that the risk has been entirely eliminated. We don't think that um, all the tsunami production mechanisms, the coupling mechanisms, have been exhausted. So, um, so I'm just going to review um, medio tsunami and then alternative methods, uh, po possible coupling method, uh, mechanisms from air bursts. And then finally, um, I want to talk about um, air blast coupling from a large impact. So in a sense, this is a little bit of a bait and switch because I said this was air burst, about, going to be about air burst generated tsunami, but I'm going to focus really on air blast coupling from a large impact because what Vasily and I decided to do rather than to try to do these uh, uh, effects um, was to start with the worst possible case, try, try to do a bounding case um, to show that you can get a strong tsunami or to identify whether or not there really is a, a strong enough coupling mechanism um, that there still is some risk from asteroid generated tsunami. Um, so I presented this uh, for the first time um, four years ago in Flagstaff. Not everyone here was there. Um, so not everyone has seen this, but, um, but I was thinking about Tunguska, um, the, the Tunguska type airburst, where you get an explosion, the fireball descends, it pushes a bow shock ahead of it, but it's also enhanced by the explosion, and you get this shock wave running across the surface followed by a rarefaction, and I was thinking very much like a medio tsunami where you have a pressure wave coupled to, a, to an ocean wave, perhaps you could get something like that. But, but what I want to point out in this, where you have an air burst at altitude, the, the, the wave is actually coming from above. So the trace velocity of that wave across the surface is actually supersonic. It's significantly greater than the sound speed. It's divided by the tangent of the, of the angle that it's coming in. So, uh, and, and the fastest, in the deepest water, the fastest tsunami, um, is below sound speed in air, so it's hard to get a resonance. And I'm going to just very quickly say something about resonances. I was inspired by the fact that there were um, tsunami and air quotes on Jupiter after the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact. Nobody really understood what formed these. These are really internal waves. There's not a dis density discontinuity, so it's not really a tsunami, but it's physically very similar to a tsunami. It's a, it's a gravity wave. and it was probably generated by the acoustic wave, namely the, the shock wave from the exploding comet on Jupiter. And if you look at uh, uh, events on Earth that can generate pressure changes, you can just have weather and weather fronts moving across surfaces of water. And weather fronts don't move anywhere near the speed of sound, but in, uh, but in shallow bodies like the Mediterranean and Lake Michigan, these very weak, I mean, this is the pressure difference here, very small changes in pressure sustained and moving at the right speed can hit a resonance and you can get a significant tsunami that then gets focused into harbors. Um, so, so this is what I was thinking about. And in fact, you can get, uh, uh, so if U is the, that trace velocity, of the pressure wave across the surface of the water. Um, the slowest that can really be is the sound speed if it's moving into still air. If it's moving into a headwind, it can be slower. Um, and uh, C is the, uh, is the shallow water um, wave speed of a tsunami in ocean water. And, and of course, that, so, so the C is a function of, um, of water depth 
And the Shoemaker-Levy 9, the Froude number, which is the ratio of those, was 1.6. Nevertheless, you, you did appear to get coupling. For a very sharp discontinuity, like a shock wave, you really have to be right on the resonance, but a shock wave is followed by a rarefaction wave, and then a recompression that does not always shock up. So you have a gradient that's moving along, and it can be moving along more slowly, or a, a, a point of a given uh, amount of gradient can be moving and actually couple. So that's the idea. Um, these are some other coupling mechanisms uh, that I proposed that I still want to look at. Um, I think we can eliminate some of these because they're rare. I think they can generate um, tsunami, but they are probably, you know, if you do the ensemble risk, if they're rare, well, you probably don't have to worry about them only in rare exceptional cases. Um, so one is, uh, the, the main one is blast and, and uh, rarefaction. So that's the main mechanism we're talking about. But from an airburst, again, this blast wave is moving too fast. Um, but this is what I was talking about, the blast, the discontinuity, the rarefaction, which is uh, not a discontinuity, and then the recompression, and that's typical. Expanding toroidal vortices, we see these, and they can move much more slowly. It's basically like a horizontal tornado spinning across the surface. Now, there are, in, a, in 2D axisymmetric simulations, there are emergent phenomena. You've, you've basically created... Uh, uh, because of symmetry, the symmetry you've imposed, you require, almost require them to form. If you do a 3D simulation, they still form. They're not as strong, they're not as stable. Um, I think I show one of, uh, a movie of this. Maybe not, and I'll just pa pass ahead here. Um, let's see if I can start this. This is a 3D. I don't know how I'm... Okay, there's, there's the movie. So you can see some of these vortices moving along much more slowly, and those could be in a Proudman resonance. And do I click the mouse to get the movie to go? Here we go. Okay, so this is a 3D version of that, and you can see some vortices forming on the surface. Um, but this is full 3D symmetry, and you don't get these strong, strong vortices. So we kind of eliminated that as being a likely scenario. And then plume ejection and collapse. And I showed this, oh darn it. I showed this movie earlier, um, this for, for the scenario. And so you look at the scale on this, it's uh, 1,200, um, kilometers wide, 800 kilometers high. And if you look, you can see where the entry wake, um, there's a, a ballistic plume that ejects and it comes back. It falls onto the top of the atmosphere and that actually creates a compression wave that goes all the way back down to the surface again. And that creates a pressure on the water as that propagates down to the water. And that actually gets to the water faster than the shock wave does. So that's the first thing to hit the water. And we actually see that. Um, and you can see the, the, and I'm sorry about the scale here. I didn't, I, I just let it auto scale. So there you see the, the, the wave running out ahead. It's coming up from above. And so that's going too fast to get into a resonance. So the real resonance is coming from behind the initial shock wave. And so I gave all this to um, Vasily. Um, this is what he did actually for the asteroid generated tsunami um, uh, workshop. And he put it right in the Javan Trench because that was where we felt we could get closest to the resonance. And you can actually see that, the, that, that in the direction of the trench in both directions, the, the wave is a little bit stronger. So it does appear to be uh, closer to a resonance and the coupling does seem to be better. And here's a couple of movies. And he just did this a couple of weeks ago. And we haven't done our, our full analysis, but this is hot off the press. And you can see actually that the, the First, the first motion is positive, then there's a big negative phase followed by a second positive, and that is due to the shape of this end wave. Compression, rarefaction, recompression. And here's one further offshore. And it turns out that if you plot, and if I have time I'll show them, if you plot the maximum amplitude as a function of position, it doesn't really make a difference. 
if you're in this area, it doesn't make a different, big difference at the shore that you've moved it offshore. Um, it's relatively insensitive to how far away it is, the, the impact. Um, so in, in response to some questions I had earlier in the week about whether this is truly a tsunami um, and whether it's sensitive, how is it sensitive to depth, um, Vasily prepared this. So these, these high amplitudes are uh, generated by the initial shock propagating over, and they're not on the resonance, but over in the trench direction, they're closer to the resonance, where when you are going into shallower water here, you're well off the resonance and you're not coupling as well. But the strongest coupling is coming from that slower secondary wave, that secondary compression that's actually moving against a headwind. So it's moving more slowly, it's closer to a resonance. And is this or is this not a tsunami? Um, well, here's the width of it. Um, it varies from something like 70 to 100 um, kilometers in wavelength. It's a, got a, a, a period of um, seven to 10 minutes, roughly. So that is a tsunami. And for the, the close one, it's a higher, shorter wave tsunami. For the far one, it's a lower amplitude, but longer tsunami. And, and so there's really, it's a volume question. There's about the same volume of water and where, it's, where it piles up and hits the shore, you get a very similar inundation, whether it's here or whether it's here. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna quickly go through these charts. These are the maximum um, um, wave height charts for a given location. So this is a near, on one of Paul's nearby points. Um, here's the Here's the scale, the distance scale, and this is minus one meter, I think, and this is plus five meters. And if we move it away, um, still we get very sim similar maximum depth, sim similar flooded areas further away, again, similar. Now, this is far enough away that you're not gonna get a significant blast wave on the coast. So you, you have moved it away to get Tokyo out of the blast zone, but it's still going to get significant in inundation. In fact, inundation that's very similar to if it had been here. And here's one that's right on the deepest part of the Japan Trench. And there's a close-up. We already showed this. Um, there was, uh, uh, Basili did do dispersive and non-dispersive just for comparison and showed that the, there's a wave train with a dispersive wave model, um, but the total, the total wavelength and the total uh, amount of water in that is about the same. So you're gonna get very similar um, effects on the, on the shore. And so here are our conclusions. Um, large airbursts can uh, produce significant water gravity waves um, leading to a regional coastal Thread. The suction phase appears to be much more strongly coupled, you know, that following rarefaction followed by the compression um, than the initial air blast. Um, coastal inundation doesn't depend strongly on the source distance, at least over the range we studied. Um, water depth increases amplitude but decreases wavelength. Um, and then, you know, we, um, there are these smaller coupling mechanisms that we haven't really looked at, but, but I'm kind of willing to concede on those because they're starting to seem like they're rare. Um, and then the air-driven impact and airburst tsunamis may be, may be significant contributors to overall risk, and I think they need to be uh, quantified. And my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Quick comment, I hope you're not showing those uh, images for that huge red explosion off Japan <laughs> to, the pu to the public in the context of uh, our study here. Yeah, I... I um, Please change the colors. That, that was a graphic produced by Vasily, and he... This and was, he's not here to take the blame. Yeah, this was, this was weekend work for him, and so I, I didn't actually see that until about a week before I got on the airplane to come here. Questions, please, from the audience. Okay. Our next speaker is Galen Gitzler, and uh, he has done, uh, con been continuing work in this area. Uh, and in fact, you must have been studying tsunami formation for at least 30 years. <laughs> not, not 30, but uh, 15, certainly, or almost 20, I guess. 
Um, now, we're hoping that this changeover works soon. <clears throat> um, so, right, so I've, I've been, um, and I, a um, little bit uh, in disagreement with what Mark has just said, and, and, and I'm anxiously looking forward to reading the, uh, the, the paper with, um, that, um, that he has written with Vasily about this to uh, um, see if I understand it a little bit better. Um, in any case, um, I'll just launch into, that's the abstract which you already have, and, and you um, also should have the, the paper. Um, I've put up a slide like this at virtually every planetary defense conference that I've come to, and um, maybe if, if Mark is still around, I'll have to do it every time <laughs> from now on as well. But um, um, I still maintain that, that uh, um, you know, as, as David uh, mentioned uh, with regard to the workshop, that the tsunami danger from small asteroids has been seriously overestimated in the past. The waves that are generated are high and turbulent, um, but they're not long. They're um, the order of the uh, initial transient crater size and so forth. They dissipate considerable ener um, energy interacting with the atmosphere. Um, and they're most, mostly similar to the, the kind of fjord collapse tsunamis like in, um, in Latuya Bay and um, Ta Fjord um, and the future Oknesa event in, in Norway. Um, splash wave can be very dangerous to shores um, that are nearby. Um, the atmospheric effects are um, uh, relatively more dangerous just as in land impacts. Um, in particular, you don't want to be close to an impact site. Here is a typical coastal city. Um, and there is the, uh, the, the initial splash from, from such a wave. Um, for the asteroid-generated tsunami workshop last summer, I did um, a whole bunch of, of, of runs, and this is a table of them. Again, this is in the paper. The um, one thing that I've been um, looking at more specifically since um, since last August is the amount of water that's ejected up into the stratosphere um, because that's of interest for, um, for possible climate effects and so forth. Airburst generated runs in magenta don't do much, but the, but the larger um, runs generate um, significant fractions of a gigaton of water um, deposited directly into the stratosphere. Um, water in the stratosphere tends to stay there. Water in the troposphere, as you know, rains out on, on a, on a bi-weekly basis or so, but, but water in the stratosphere um, does not rain out and, and it tends to stay up there. Um, whether it forms um, ice crystals and cirrus clouds, or whether it, uh, um, as a cooling uh, mechanism on the planet, or whether it uh, uh, contributes in vapor form to, um, to greenhouse effect as a warming mechanism, that's uh, beyond, um, beyond my expertise. Um, I think it would be very interesting to work with some, um, some uh, climate scientists on just what um, a sudden injection of a gigaton of water into the stratosphere might do. Um, it's probably a local effect rather than a global effect, but, um, but it might be interesting nevertheless. I apologize to those of you who were at the um, Asteroid Generated Tsunami Workshop because um, you've seen some of these movies before. Um, this is the blast wave produced um, pressure here, and that's the um, uh, mass fraction of water um, going up into the, into the stratosphere. So you see the, the blast wave is very dramatic and, and, um, and very much like, like a, um, an explosion from a, from a large nuclear device, which you know, these, are, these are sort of um, uh, many megaton, um, 100 megaton, um, uh, 250 meter, meter asteroid, which is kind of on the top, top end of the, of the um, things that we were asked to look at at the, uh, at the um, workshop. Um, in terms of of what actually happens on the surface of the water, it's easier if you take away um, all of the stuff shown in the previous movie and just do a slice through the, um, the um, trajectory plane. And so that's what is shown here in, um, in a density contour. And so you see a, um, the splash curtain asymmetric, much higher on the down, downrange side than on the uprange side. Um, the crater fills in with water rushing in from both sides, produces a jet that um, may rise up to you know, a few kilo kilometers in size. Um, and then it's a collapse of that jet that gives rise to a rim wave that then propagates out. And, that, um, and the rim wave, um, if the if the, if the entry angle is fairly steep, in this case it's 45 degrees, the rim wave tends to be nearly circularly symmetric. It's, it's more asymmetric at, um, at shallower angles. But the interesting thing about the rim wave is that it breaks um, immediately on formation. You don't normally see breaking waves in a five kilometer depth ocean, um, but, um, but these waves are very highly turbulent and there's another reason why they break um, so early. 
and that's the fact that the, that, that the waves are opposed by atmospheric winds coming in the opposite direction. So here's a contour plot of horizontal wind speed in meters per second, and um, here's the, the um, the wave in the water moving this way at 100 meters per second, the wave in the water here moving that way at 100 meters per second, but in the atmosphere you see um, winds that are um, as strong, if not stronger, directly opposing um, the, the motion of the water. And so, um, so you have, you, um, you know, normally in an ocean you have um, wind-generated waves where it's a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. The wind moves in a certain direction and, and it excites waves moving in the same direction. Here you have um, a wave that is generated by an impact and opposed by winds in the atmosphere coming in the opposite direction. So that impedes the development of, of the winds. And I don't think that's included in, in the, in the in the model that um, that uh, um, that um, Mark and Vasily were looking at, in particular, because because um, your model, Mark, doesn't include the the water at all. You just in, have a have a reflective boundary condition. But we, I mean, we'll need to discuss this um, uh, in more detail later on. Um, and then here is a um, a nice plot uh, produced by um, the visualization folks that I've been working with, um, looking at a volume rendering of the winds. Um, and they they're from Texas. These uh, these people that I've been working with. So um, so they um, scale the wind in terms of the Saffir Simpson hurricane force. Um, in uh, the colors yellow through red, uh, one two three four five. And then in magenta they gave up, and because everything above there is above 200 meters per second, well above. Saffir Simpson and more like um, F5 tornado winds. But the interesting thing is that the, um, the winds are much stronger on the downrange side, um, and the winds, um, as I showed on the previous graph, are all directed inwards towards, towards this jet and then upwards um, as, in, um, as in a mushroom cloud. Um, so again, opposing the direction of any wave that you might be producing. So here's um, a comparison of, of three runs, um, with one with no airburst at all, one with an airburst at five kilometers, one with an airburst at ten kilometers. This is kind of this we showed at the uh, um, at the AGT workshop, basically demonstrating that um, that you get much more disturbance um, of the water with um, with a, a direct impact than you do with um, with um, airbursts, and and particularly if the airburst is high enough, you hardly get anything any disturbance of the water. Um, and then if you, um, size matters, uh, um, a hundred meter asteroid which, which air bursts at five kilometers, you have virtually nothing reaching the uh, surface of the water. At a 250 meter diameter, you, you, you do get um, some disturbance of the water and, and some slight wave. Um, but again, it's a, this is not, a, this is not a, a, a real propagating wave. So the thing that we got interested in um, when, when doing this was the fact that um, a lot of water is, um, is injected into the stratosphere. And here's, um, um, my Texas friends call this a ghost plot um, of um, water mass fraction um, uh, being ejected above the, uh, above the surface of the water. And here's a seven kilometer line, which um, that's... Um, not quite the stratosphere, but um, then um, here is a plot as a function of time showing how um, how the the accumulation of water in the stratosphere um, increases with time. And in this particular case, you got a, a quarter of a um, a quarter of a million tons of um, quarter of a billion tons of um, of water injected into the um, into the stratosphere just in this local region. And then what happens to it after that is is uh, is beyond what we have um, what we have looked at here. Um, the other thing that we've just started to look at is um, is ablation. We discovered um, kind of by accident that um, that the um, the uh, resolution of, of our simulations was sufficient enough um, so that we could actually look at what happens to an initially spherical projectile as it comes into the um, into the atmosphere. And and we need to. I mean, that was kind of a, a poor man's movie because I only had three frames. Um, but um, um, but we intend to do this again with uh, with with a few more frames so that we can actually see um, a little bit closer what's going on. And um, unfortunately, we don't have um, radiative transfer um, in this particular model. But that that is something that we can we can add to it. But um, uh, you can look 
uh, here's um, a slightly different color scale, which, which enables you to see the, uh, um, the, the remaining core fragment of the, of the asteroid itself. This was an initially spherical body, and um, it is clearly pancaked out and, um, and has lost um, some 5% of its mass, um, stretching all the way out, of it, um, out into the wake. Um, in the process of, of um, losing that, it's also lost about 15% of, um, of its kinetic energy as it's coming down. And then here's a run that I did specifically for, um, for the PDC exercise, a 250-meter asteroid on a 27-degree trajectory striking the ocean above the Japan Trench. Um, and I put 11 kilometers, it's actually not quite that deep. Um, but um, uh, the, the interest, I mean, this is, this is high candy. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful to look at all these little vortices coming off and, and all of this sort of thing. Unfortunately, um, I've been um, shut out of computing time um, and could only run this as far as 28 seconds into the calculation. And, um, and I'm likely not to get any more computing time at Los Alamos because I've used so much over the last, over the last year or so. Um, but, um, but anyway, it's been fun. And it's been fun um, working, with, uh, working on this and working with this, uh, this uh, community. Um, the conclusions, um, the, Steve Chesley put it very nicely at, at our AGT workshop last summer that, um, that you know, if you have a, um, a, an impact near the shore, the blast will kill you and then the, the splash will, rush your, uh, will um, sweep your remains out to sea. Um, <clears throat> so that's a sanguine way of putting it. Um, if, um, in a far field effect, um, within a few hundred kilometers, very much depending on local bathymetric focusing, um, you could get wet, um, but that's going to be more like a storm surge rather than a true tsunami. Um, and um, in terms of the atmospheric effects, you get water and dissolved salts put up into the stratosphere. And I don't know what, uh, what that will do, but it's probably not good. Um, and so we should just keep watching the skies for asteroids in this range. Um, with that, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, questions, please? Mark. Um, so Galen, um, we, I think, as my old boss used to say, we're in violent agreement about the near field displacement coupling to the tsunami. In fact, I'm in so much agreement with you that I don't even bother to model it. Um, you've convinced me, the breaking waves, you've, convi you've convinced me of all that. So, but, but you focus, you, that's what you're focused on. In fact, you know, what you've shown is your blast wave goes off the screen and it goes downrange and by all the stuff that you're focused on starts happening, my tsunami, our tsunami is forming off of your frame. So um, I would encourage you to, to see if you can reproduce what we're doing. Fine, and um, I mean, I, I mean, Vasily and I have talked um, about this a number of times as well, and, and um, yeah, we, we will certainly continue this, deal, this dialogue. Um, and um, and um, yeah, you're, I understand you will be up at Los Alamos more frequently in the future, and, and so we can, certainly, we can certainly talk about this, and I, look, I very much look forward to doing that. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again, Galen. Our next speaker is. Is this on? Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Our next speaker is Suhil Isadine from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory with a large and distinguished group of co authors. And uh, Suhil is one of the people that's looked at this whole range from the impact to the production of waves and what happens to them. So I look forward to this. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Suhail Ezzedin. I would like to thank uh, Luke Oman. He's from uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center. And we're going to show you some of the global impact, actually, that Dave Morris uh, was talking about. And Professor Koshimura Sunuchi from the University of Tohoku, and he gave me the high resolution bathymetry around um, uh, Japan. So. I did not steal this picture from Mark Boslow, who stole it from, I stole it from the, from the web. How do you advance, actually? So we kept doing what we do, which is um, uh, we identify there is a gap in the coupling between an asteroid impact on the surface ocean. And we decided actually to build 
our own coupling between uh, Geodon, which uh, our hydro code to do the impact uh, in the near field, to a water wave propagation code. And when we browsed actually the available tools, there are several of them available on the internet, only very few actually they can do the job. And most of them are initiated either by land slide or an earthquake. And so we decided to go ahead and do our own coupling between uh, Geodan or ALI 3 d and uh, the shallow water wave equations or the nonlinear water wave equations. And we propagate those, those waves all the way to the shore and we do some interaction between water waves and shore to assess uh, flood and zones, et cetera. And I will show you some of the results. We have contributed in the past to several exercises. I list them here. And this one is the workshop that uh, Dave was, David was uh, mentioning early on. And uh, we kept improving our coupling as well as uh, the complexity of the equations that we are solving. Um, more recently, I'm focusing only on 3D Boussinesque water wave equations with the coupling of Geodyne, and that's, those are the results I'm gonna show you today have been done using the latest of the coupling. Moreover, every time I do some of these runs, I do similar runs with the regressed um, versions in order to uh, check for consistency. Here's how we split the domain. Again, um, this is the impact location. It's the near field. And this is the uh, far field location where we solve the water wave equation, either the nonlinear one or the shallow one. And so the nonlinear feed will allow us actually to uh, span scales from the micro scale to the seconds. Uh, and the spatial scales are from the millimeters to a half a kilometer. While the far feed, we can go from seconds to days and the spatial scales to hundreds of or thousands of kilometers. This is, allows us to get the conservative scheme um, more computationally um, uh, efficient, and we can span nine folds in spatial resolutions and 11 folds in temporal resolutions, things that it's very hard to do using just hydrocode uh, by itself. I'm going to show you the application of that code to uh, the PDC exercise. Here's again the patch of our simulation. This is the trajectory of the, the asteroid impact, location 1 through 102. Um, this is the largest domain so far I've done. It uh, spans 1.2 billion nodes. And uh, the bathymetry is relaxed here. Um, it's more complex in this area. So I decided to show you a flavor of three, uh, three impacts, impact number one, uh, as, uh, 63 and, uh, 36 and 63. To do that, actually, we equipped actually the, all the coasts of Japan as well as the coast of Asia with a lot of uh, gauges or uh, stations where we can monitor all the water um, wave height as function of time. And so again, I'm going to show you these three impact locations, and I'm going to summarize some of the results on the two stations of observation. Then I will come back and resummarize all of those in a map. Again, I want to stress that we use the latest of the high resolution of the bathymetry that Professor Koshimura from the University of Tohoku gave me. I don't have movies. We've seen enough. So I'm going to show you snapshots. These are time snapshot every hour for impact number one. I use a 250 meter asteroid. As you can see, there's the, the wave has been uh, generated, propagated, heads the shore. After four hours, it's pretty much reaching the shore of Japan. Five hours pretty much subsides, and there is really no effect after that at all. If you move it closer to the shore, it's pretty much where uh, Vasily and Mark Boslow uh, impacted their location. So you have some refraction actually after one hour from the shore. Um, then the waves actually propagate away from the shore itself. If we are within this basin, actually, it has a nice bathymetry. So it's deep here. Actually, it gets narrower here. It's almost closed this way. And uh, there's a high, steep, actually, slope. So most of the water that you generate here gets trapped and then moves forward and gets amplified by conservation of energy. And you will have still persistent high, um, high water waves. 
The way we summarize it is we looked at all the simulations that we've done. So I've done 102 for an ensemble risk assessment. And here what we did is the trajectory number, site, the, the impact location. So it's from 1 to 102. And we uh, presented the maximum water height in these two stations, station 370 and station 128. And you see that the water wave reaches about as high as about 12 feet or so. Say 15 feet divided by three, it's about five meter maximum. Again, I have to emphasize that these stations are two, meters, uh, two miles away from the shore because for the nonlinear regime and the interaction with the shore, I have to use a different code. And these are two, two uh, time history actually of all the simulations for the same two stations. But I showed you, I'm showing here a different realization with, uh, with the min and the max envelope that NOAA actually always interested to use those for their flood and uh, calculations. What you can do, you can say for specific prefectures, you can decide what is the threshold that they are interested in, say two and a half feet. You can draw a line and you can determine actually which location that they are, um, may cause a problem to have a water height that uh, overpassed the maximum limit that they are interested in. In the next slide, I'm gonna show you for the case of five feet and how we can summarize the coast along uh, Japan. So what I did is if the water height is greater than five feet, I'll put a red dot. If it's between one and five, yellow dot. And if it's uh, less than a foot, it's a green. And you pretty much, you see the trajectory and that's pretty much um, the color scheme, um, what are the um, area of interest. And I did it also for the Asian coast, but I'm showing here only the Japanese coast. As you could expect, the most impacted region is around where the impacts are. And further far, actually, you have less impact. You see some red dots that they appear from time to time, and actually, I went thoroughly and checked them. Actually, sometimes you have a focal mechanism, and so by amplifying two, two um, two waves, you may end up by reaching a, a threshold wave. So again, this map will look different if you change um, the scale, of course. Um, these are in line with what I explained. So when you have shots here, they get entrapped, they go all the way up. Uh, this is shallower than there. So therefore, by conservation energy goes higher. So the wave bounces back and forth between these two uh, coasts. So that's the reason why you see some red dots there. Again, several people talked about global effect of impact of water. So um, uh, I needed another challenge. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I started working with Lukeman to uh, create a source, actually. So this is a similar picture than uh, um, Galen, he showed. So once you have an impact, you have rims, you have a breakup. But most of the energy actually goes into transformation of the vapor, the water into vapor. Vapor, this is a sea salt, so it has a chlorine. Chlorine gets reacted with the bromine and uh, oxides of, and then it goes up all the way to the stratosphere and then it gets accumulated. So our goal is to create a source. So what we've done is I hand the source, uh, similar to the one that Galen showed to, uh, to look. Look is using, uh, this a global climate model. And so we try to do it for 250 meters and actually, we constrained actually our um, uh, atmospheric chemistry with some publication that they're published by the Italian team from ESA. And so with the 250 meter, actually, we did not see any changes in the global climate uh, um, um, scale. Um, when we started doing this was in tabletop exercise, exercise too, so it's not customized for the BTC 2017. And we, we plugged actually the source in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Then we decided to look for a threshold. What should be the, the size of the, the diameter of the asteroid in order to see a global climate change? And so this is a movie. So here it is. Hopefully it works. Um, so what you see is the date and uh, every day. He maps actually the effect of the chlorine emanated from um, the impact of 400 meter uh, created by the codes that I give you and I give him a source. And you see how it gets recirculated in the, mainly in the North Hemisphere. 
And so this will affect actually the bromine, the chlorine, as well as the ozone layers, and will decrease actually the temperature of the North Hemisphere by one to three Kelvin degrees. So this is a slice of different um, speciation, like I just mentioned. And with that, actually, I take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yes, Galen. Thanks, Sir Hale. Very um, excellent work. Um, I was wondering what the wavelength was of the of the um, waves that you saw impacting the um, east so east coast of Japan. So the wavelength from this side, uh, impact one to forty two, was about uh, half a kilometer maximum. Uh, Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, Clemens has, was at our last PDC, but he has not been as centrally involved in many of these calculations as, uh, as some of us, and has to some degree independently verified things that others are reporting here. So we're, thank you for being here, and immediate effects of asteroid impacts on the human population. Thanks for the introduction, David. Um, yeah, I'm Clemens Rumpf. I'm from the University of Southampton. Um, my research is funded by the EU Stardust project, um, and uh, this work represents a large part of my PhD research, and my PhD supervisors were Hugh Lewis and Peter Atkinson. Yeah, and today I'm talking about immediate effects of asteroid impacts on the human population. So the motivation of the research was really that asteroids, it's, it's known that asteroids uh, generate different impact effects, and we wanted to answer the question, which effects are most dominant uh, to inform disaster preparation um, and response, and to improve our overall understanding of the asteroid impact hazard. So um, I'm gonna this is the outline of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about a bit of, uh, about the method, so about the impactor sample that was used to generate the results, and about the models, impact effect modeling and vulnerability modeling uh, to come up with the results. We get, then get to the results, and they are roughly split into two categories, global, the global scenario, um, where we take the entire uh, sample around the globe, and then water and land impactors, where we just strictly look at water and land impactors. And then we come to uh, summary and conclusions. So the impactor sample um, originated based uh, of an artificial impactor sample that was kindly provided to us by Stephen Chesley. Um, the corresponding uh, reference is up there. We then analyzed that sample for impact uh, characteristics, such as impact location distribution, impact angle distribution, and impact velocity distribution. And uh, we then generated a 50,000 um, uh, strong impactor sample. Um, so here's uh, how that 50,000 impactor distribution uh, realizes itself over Europe. So you get a sense of the density of impacts uh, that we get. And the color coding is uh, the impact angle. So each impact has randomly assigned based on the impact angle distribution and impact angle. Uh, what we didn't do was we didn't use a density distribution. Instead, we used uh, static 3,100 kilograms per cubic meter density value for all impactors. And uh, we ran this sample 24 times, every time giving the whole sample a different um, uh, diameter value. So in total we had 1.2 uh, million impactors. Okay, um, these are the impact and vulnerability um, modeling details. So we use seven impact effects which are based on Collins, Melosh, and Marcus, uh, so basically the Purdue impact simulator code, um, or those models, and the impact effects that we modeled are air blast, overpressure shock, thermal radiation, tsunami cratering, seismic shaking, and ejecta. Um, we also used actual coastline and elevation data for tsunami propagation, and we used the 2015 global population map roughly on a 4.5 by 4.5 kilometer grid. Um, yeah. Good, yeah, the vulnerability models are published in the second paper referenced on this slide. 
Um, so just to give you a quick graphical representation of how uh, this modeling worked, you have one of these impact points uh, in the middle of the impact zone where it's red. The color is meant to show the impact strength, um, so the impact effect strength. So in the center we have strong impact effect strength. And then as the effects propagate away from the impact size, they attenuate in strength over distance and get weaker. Um, and this can then be coupled to the vulnerability models. Vulnerability models, so this is for seismic shaking. The basic uh, function of vulnerability models is to translate the effect strength into how many people will die. So um, now we can pick uh, one um, ring, like uh, one distance ring, now the orange ring. So um, this corresponds to a given uh, impact effect strength. We can then go to the function and read uh, what portion of the vulnerability would die in this, at this distance in that ring uh, from the impact point. Then we already get to the results. Um, so these are the results that we came up with and uh, they are presented on, on the X scale you have the impactor diameter. Um, on the Y scale you have average loss per impactor. So we, uh, cal we recorded the total loss that the sample produced and divided that by the impactor number so we get average loss per impactor. Um, this is a cum cumulative stack plot so the different colors represent the different impact effects can already see that red corresponds to and the wind blast dominates. Um, and uh, you can also see in this uh, plot we marked on the left side uh, at what point we recorded first casualties, in this case 18 meters, uh, and due to wind blast and thermal radiation, which actually correlates pretty well with Chelyabinsk, um, where you could argue that uh, it was right on the threshold of causing fatalities. Um, and then another way to represent that is if you just look at the total damage at each, each uh, size and just look at how this damage is, uh, what this uh, damage consists of or which effect contribute to that damage. And then you, you get, you know, um, yeah, that aerodynamic effects, so wind and overpressure really dominate the picture. And this is in the global scenario, so covering the whole globe. Um, thermal radiation is pretty dominant, and tsunamis, as we already heard, uh, we found only to contribute about 20% in the global scenario. Um, we also found on the left side, again, uh, one of the dashed lines, that for the given density value, we needed a minimum of 56 diameter asteroids uh, to have surface impacts. Everything else, everything smaller, produced air bursts. And then as you move to larger sizes, uh, you get more and more surface impacts. Um, there's one caveat here that I wanted to point out. Uh, just a like few days, like uh, two days before I came to Japan, it was pointed out that there's a potential issue with the thermal radiation model. So I will check that I didn't have the time yet to validate it, but um, if there's an issue, I, I, I will check that when I'm back in, in uh, England. And if there's an issue, um, then this thermal radiation contribution might shrink. Uh, all the conclusions will remain valid. Thermal radiation will remain a significant effect, but the thermal radiation contribution might shrink. Uh, so I will correct these results should this be valid, basically. Um, okay, that was the global scenario. So now land and water impactors. So for land impactors, no big surprise there. Um, aerodynamic effects dominate. Thermal radiation is pretty significant. But maybe what is also significant is what you're not seeing. So we find that ground-based effects, so cratering, seismic shaking, and ejector outthrow account for less than about 1% of uh, the total damage contribution. Um, yeah, and then for uh, below are the water impacts. Yeah, top is uh, land impacts. Uh, at the bottom are the water impacts. And everything, when you have air bursts, um, all the damage is due to near coastal impacts where the um, aerothermal effects propagate onto land and cause fatalities. And once you have uh, surface impacts, you get tsunamis. And then for water impacts, um, tsunamis tend to dominate. What we also get from our uh, results, or what we can extract, is uh, a function of average loss uh, per impact diameter. Um, so the red line corresponds to 
uh, the global scenario, so you can plug in a diameter value and you get kind of an average loss value that you would expect. Uh, we also fitted these two functions to the data and uh, they could be used, for example, for residual risk analysis of uh, the asteroid population. Um, and yeah, what you also can see, what has already been stated at this conference is that water impacts, which is represented by the blue line, and land impacts, which is represented by the uh, green line, um, they are separated by about a factor of 10. So water impacts, again, are about 10 times less damaging as uh, land impactors on average. Then we did some sensitivity analysis. I'll be fairly quick, go quickly over those. So we varied um, the, yeah, the sensitivity in the vulnerability models and we saw um, how the results uh, respond, to, uh, respond to this uh, variation. And we see that in the small sizes air bursting regime, we have higher variability and for larger impacts, uh, we get less variability. Then we also looked at the fraction of the sample that contributed actually to um, fatalities. And then you can see that uh, for land impactors, uh, the fraction goes up very steep in the beginning and that's just uh, due by definition basically that land impactors by definition are close to population centers. So uh, it doesn't need much to have them cause fatalities. While, on the other hand, water impactors, which of course make up two-thirds of the whole um, sample, um, they need much longer to reach 50% or 90% uh, yeah, to contribute to, to damage. So this is also a measure of basically the median damage uh, you could expect. There's a lot of zeros uh, for small asteroid sizes um, and only after 60 meter diameter, the median <laughs> reaches a positive value or a greater than zero, basically. So, summary and conclusion. So we used a total of 1.2 million impacts to calculate impact effect dominance um, in the size regime up to 400 meter in diameter. We found that aerothermal effects are most dominant, ground effects are least severe. Um, tsunamis account for 20% of damage in the global uh, scenario, and land impactors at 10 times more severe than water impactors, uh, and we produced an average loss uh, per impact of a given size function, which can be used for yeah, a new risk scale or uh, residual risk analysis. So uh, this has been published uh, in this paper, which can be downloaded online, or you can come to me and I can give you a copy. Um, some acknowledgement uh, of the reviewers that had a look at this work. And yeah, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions, Galen. <laughs> thanks Clemens, uh, nice work. Um, I was wondering what, um, um, the, the ejecta line was always this l little thin yellow um, line on there, and, and I was wondering what, what, uh, what kinds of ejecta you were looking at, secondary projectiles or, or um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the water vapor, of course, but, um, um, you know, the, what kinds of ejecta were you, were you considering? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, that was only considered in uh, land impacts, actually, so water is not considered at all in, in that scenario. So it's, I, I'm very, um, I very closely follow the Collins and Mellosh paper here, uh, yeah, which is mainly land impactors. Other questions or comments? There's one up there. Yeah, Clemens, really, really nice work. I was wondering if, wondered if you could say two words about the tsunami modeling. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, it's an uh, analytical model. Uh, we use a ray tracing algorithm to just identify the coastline that is aff affected from the uh, impact site. And then we have an analytical description that gives us a wave size over distance. So we look at how far each of this coastline is away from the impact site, and then we get a wave height. Um, we use an, an, in deep water, so we go to a point 800, with 800 meters uh, water depth, and from there we use something called the Erie Barron approach, and then we get the um, run up, and uh, then we, yeah, so we have bathymetry uh, data to get the 800 meter point, and then we have bathymetry and topology data to uh, calculate the run in.
from the last uh, 800 meters in. Yeah, right. So Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, one more. Yes? Um, as far as I understand, this is some kind of global estimate. Is it possible to make a local estimate where, for example, you take into account the difference uh, of the, the different effects? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, so that code allows for that. And um, if you take a look at the second paper here, there's a case study for Berlin, London, and Rio de Janeiro. And in Rio de Janeiro, we move the impact point out into the ocean. And you can see how the impact effects stack against each other in this very specific case, basically. I would add, as one of the people who first introduced the idea of global effects 30 years ago, that it's an interesting topic, probably deserving substantial re-examination in what we, terms of what we know now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, Donovan Mathias, who will be talking about the ensemble effects, the, for some of us, the bottom line of, uh, of what we're trying to do here. Because we don't expect to live to see a real impact, I would add, although it could always happen. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, boy, hard to go at the end of this session, I think, today. Great spite, uh, great talks given so far. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the reconvening of the Stokes et al. science definition team from 2003. So in 2016, uh, Lindley Johnson and the PDCO at NASA headquarters have reconvened the team to use the current modeling techniques, look at current surveys, and go back to the questions that were originally posed in 03. And so I'm not going to talk about the entire SDT. The report is expected out end of June-ish, so I'm just going to talk about the risk assessment results uh, as applied to the SDT. So you guys have seen this a couple of times, uh, makes life a little easier. Um, Lorian has been presenting results all through the week on specific impact cases, and even though there's not one specific site that we you know, analyzed in high fidelity, uh, we consider that as a specific case. So she's looking at one object and representing the ground track and the uncertainty in the velocities, the densities, and the different locations. So now we're going to switch to the complete global look. And when I say ensemble in this case, it's a statistical representation of what we would know about, or what we don't know, our, our estimate of all possible impacts. And of course, you can't do all, so we use a statistical representation um, and look at impacts all over the globe from a size range from 10 or tens of meters up to 10 kilometers, uh, the whole range of densities, velocities, and kind of our best representation of the statistical uncertainty of all of the parameters that one might use to model that. Um, just not, I won't go through much of this because you've seen it, but we start with the uncertainty distributions on the key parameters that describe the impact scenario. Uh, we use the probabilistic asteroid impact risk model, I'll probably say pair, so sorry about that, um, and do the integration using Lorian's fragment cloud model, bringing in the physics, the reduced order modeling of the impact consequences that are done by hydro code assessment, Mike, Daryl, uh, building on the, standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. Um, as part of the integration, we do have the ablation model that's built in. Uh, Eric talked about that. So this is really the culmination of the, the group of work and an application towards the SDT. Um, the location, the impact location is randomly distributed over the Earth, and then once we compute the damage radius, and like Clemens was just talking about, we compare the blast, the thermal radiation, uh, global effects, which we'll talk about toward the end, and the totally, uh, total consensus of tsunami. These are all brought together, and we take the largest amount of casualties for each of the impact scenarios and statistically track that. So for the science definition team, uh, we used 60 million realizations to generate our results. Um, and if you're familiar with the 2003 report, I just wanted to give a bulleted list of things that have changed specifically in the risk modeling part of the SDT. So first of all, we're using a Monte Carlo framework that you've heard about many, many times. Uh, instead of picking a specific object and using that to get 
to represent the, the collection, the collective, the ensemble, if you will, we actually are using our 60 million realizations and integrating each of these hypothetical scenarios and computing the damage for each of that. Uh, the input parameters are based on what we would consider the best knowledge. Uh, we might be wrong, you know, that's part of the game, but we're putting uncertainty distributions on densities, velocities, uh, strengths, et cetera. Um, we are using the fragment cloud model that Lorian talked about, so in some ways we're, we're expanding on what has been done before with the pancake or the discrete fragmentation models, kind of trying to bring the best of the both worlds, and you saw some great light curve matching for that, and so that's the core of the trajectory integration through the atmosphere. Uh, root, we use blast overpressure. We don't specifically separate winds and blast. We combine those together, compare that to thermal radiation for the local damage. Um, oh, and I had a question. Clemens, I have a question for you. Uh, thermal radiation is, uh, dominates depending on what you assume for the, the luminous efficiency. So we have a model that, you know, that's based on columns, kind of the same that you've heard before. Um, and I'm not gonna to talk too much about the difference between those two, but they're, they're lumped into blast and thermal. And then we do have a tsunami model. Let's just skip on that. <laughs> the impact parameters, uh, very similar to the distribution you just saw. Um, we use the Neowise uh, albedo distribution. The velocity came from Bill Bodke and his orbital model. Entry angle is the traditional uh, distribution from zero to nine degrees with the most likely being at 45. Um, we did vary density as a function of uh, taxonomic class and also made some assumptions about the internal structure, whether it was fractured or monolith or a rubble pile. And I know this is a lot to read, so I just want to show you this. It'll be in the collection of slides if they're uh, posted online. But the takeaway, the density distribution, hydrous and hydrous stones, and then a small 5% of the uh, collection were irons, um, and they were uh, represented separately uh, in the three in the three types. Strength is another one. You have to for the kind of model that Lorian is talking about. You have to make an assumption about the strength, and this is not a real laboratory strength. It's more of an aerodynamic strength. So the dynamic pressure or the, the stagnation pressure at which the object starts to fail, and we get our triggered fragmentation event. Uh, this is a tricky one because we have meteorites. We have a light curves, we, we can make inference about the, out, the strength based on the altitude of the flare, and then we have terrestrial rock analogs, and there are orders of magnitude differences in those strengths. So for this particular uh, study, we had an initial breakup strength, so this is the stagnation pressure at which the fragmentation would begin, it's not the strongest bit. Uh, we started between 0.1 and 2 megapascals, mostly based on Popova et al, and uh, the papers on that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the results. So local damage, again, is for each of the scenarios, it is whether the, the blast overpressure or the thermal radiation damage area was larger, and we took the larger of the damage areas, put it where, on the, on the globe, the distributed world population, and then the people that were affected are the, the number of population within each of the damage zones. Okay, so we have two plots. On the left, I have casualties versus object size. And the linear version is easier to see a few things. We have the orangish curve, which shows us the max. Now this isn't really a theoretical maximum. This is the max observed result from our 60 million cases. And it wasn't 60 million per size, it's a collective of 60 million. So for each of the impact sizes, so this is like the range for a 100 meter object and a 1,000. So this was the max value that came out of the simulations. The blue line represents the mean, and then the yellowish line is the minimum. And that's, well, on this scale, it's hard to see. Not zero necessarily, but this is local damage, right? So this is just the blast thermal. So if you get this in the middle of the ocean, then there would be no casualties. On the right, uh, so, so this, without getting too much onto my soapbox, averages are really helpful to compare different scenarios. And they're kind of a comfortable way to check your results against what others have done. But when you have extremely rare high consequence events like an asteroid impact, averages are, are kind of hard to, I guess, put into perspective what the real risk would be, right? So on the high end, we're talking about impactors of the impact frequency that are tens of millions of years. And so how long would you have to run your simulation if you were doing it in actual time to be able to reproduce something statistically significant at that interval, right? So 
you know, we, don't, we don't obviously do that. We compute the model based on a uh, given an impact and then the frequency or the likelihood per year discount comes from Al Harris's uh, impact population and the work that the team did, Al and Tommy Grav. Um, so a different way to look at it and maybe a way to add some additional information is to use the entire distribution for the output. And so one way to show that here is the plot on the right. So we have the object size up the side, and we have a casualty threshold in the bottom, uh, linear scale and log scale. And then the field is colored by probability per year. And so they're cumulative in one direction and complementary cumulative in the other, so let's take an example. So for example, if we wanted to look at what sized object would cause a damage or casualties of 10,000 people or more with a given frequency, right? This is risk, so you would have to pick your frequency, what your, your decision-making tolerance would be. So you would go up to that color, read off, and then that would be the size object or slower or lower that you would care about. All right, so moving on to tsunami, the same kind of thing here, and you can see that there's a little bit more uh, inflection in the curve. Uh, 10 million up here, the other one was uh, e to the eight, so we are seeing also about an order of magnitude reduction um, in the tsunami casualties compared to the local damage. Um, and then the means, you know, also down here at, you know, like yeah, one million. Uh, let's see, moving on to global effects. So global effects is also, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a ad hoc model, if you will. We took the version of the global effects model from 2003. We parametrized it in terms of kinetic energy and not just size. And then there was a triangular distribution between the max, the min, and the mean for each of the different energies. And it was parametrized in terms of percentage of the world population affected. And so you can see that versus size, very little, and on average below a kilometer. But as was talked about earlier, it's unclear when the onset of global effects starts to happen. And reality, it's not you know, all local or all global. There are regional that, that you, where, you're, where you're doing more than more damage affecting more people than just in your local blast rage region, but you haven't started to kill people globally on the other side of the planet, right? So there is a lot of uncertainty in this model, and it turns out, well, and, okay, so let me just touch this here. Um, when you look at the contour below a few hundred meters, we just don't see global effects. That's good, that's uh, expected, intuitively consistent, but when we put them all together, we now have the expected values so this is average casualties per year as a function of size, and these are cumulative. Um, and when you look at the plot, tsunami is down at the 10 or less per year. Uh, local is up in the tens, maybe. And then the global effect uh, is in the low thousands. And this is for the total uh, PHO population. I didn't say which population we were using. If you discount that for the current survey technology, that is being used today, and you extend the current surveys to 2023, and we're not talking about risk retirement or uncertainty, we're just saying, based on the estimates of what we think the, the survey cadence, discovery cadence will be, project that to 2023, the fraction that are still expected to be undiscovered, then this is what you see. And you get about, in the large size, you get a significant drop, um, and the tabular version of that here, is for the total PHO population, it's about 2,500 per year. If you look at the projected completion to 2023, it drops to 180, and the breakdown of that is about 10 of that 180 is land impact, less than one for tsunami, and 170 for the global effects. And this is, this, this is seen even though you've found most of the really large objects because of the uncertainty in size in the few hundred meter objects, which may start to roll in to global effects. And with that, take some questions. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, these estimates are made for local, uh, for this time, for local situation. What are your, um, how to say, forecast for the evolution of, of this? You just point at the current situation, current state of civilization, but civilization is evolving very quickly 
very fast and sometimes in very dangerous manner, but it should be changed, okay? You're talking about the change in the distribution of humans on the planet? Uh, not only a distribution on the human, but also a distribution of some uh, infrastructures which are important for living and so on. Could you imagine that half of the Earth will be covered with the uh, atomic plants, for instance, right. nuclear so, plants, yeah. and so on? Yeah, just example. No, no, absolutely a fair comment. We looked at just the number of people within a given damage range as a proxy for the infrastructure damage as well. Uh, my guess is this is obvious, but let me just say it anyway, which is we are scientists and engineers and so on in this uh, meeting. There are other kinds of implications that can result in casualties, deaths, due to uh, some of the effects we've been talking about in, uh, in the exercise, such as economic effects that could result in uh, depression, uh, depression, mm -hmm. or or something, and and therefore deaths by starvation and so right. on. So there is another element that cannot be analyzed by physics or chemistry, but uh, right. could be very significant. Yeah, I, absolutely fair. Um, one more. Question. There's a, one more question. If you have time, Dave. Not clear necessarily how to do this in a way that. You could do 60 million times on the computer, but absolutely. Uh, just a, a quick sort of a global question here, and, and I realize everybody in the room has a vested interest for being here, but it'd be interesting to put this in uh, perspective, look at all casualties from all sources, diseases, war, et cetera, and just see where in a global threat level we lay. Um, because I think it's of interest to many people and I think we all know what the numbers are going to be in general, qualitatively. But I think it's important that we not hide that. So, yes. Um, the way that most of the comparisons are done are in terms of expected casualties per year, right, in, a, in an average. Um, and the members of the SDT are going to be tired of hearing me say it, but you know, I have a hard time drawing those conclusions for something that happens on very long time scales. You know, we have disease every year. Earthquakes are even relatively frequent compared to what we're talking about here at the scales that we cause damage. Um, so yes, absolutely. I, I would suggest that we would need a different comparison than just the averages which are published on the web for the other sources. You know, how likely are you to get an earthquake that could kill 100 million people, right? And Donovan, you have worked on graphical ways of providing this information to decision makers, some of which you showed here and some you didn't. Yes, we're trying. We're trying to come up with both. Right. Okay, uh, thanks everybody, we're on time. <laughs> I have time for a couple of concluding remarks, uh, which may be entirely obvious to everyone, but since we do communicate with the press and the public, it's worth reiterating. Number one, we always talk about diameter. That doesn't tell the whole story, particularly if the diameter is simply derived from a photometric H magnitude. The energy is more than an order of magnitude uncertain. And that's where we get into some of these problems when we talk about what a 500 meter or a 1,000 meter object will do. It's important, obviously, to distinguish between the ensemble risk and the sort of thing we're doing in this exercise. There's a whole different kind of study that has to be done when you've identified an object and where it's going to hit uh, than there is from the ensemble effect on the whole Earth. And, and finally, there's time scale. If we can predict these things, uh, even with a tsunami, we may have only a couple of hours prediction, but in many other cases, we could have many years prediction, and that raises the whole suite of societal effects. We want to save lives, we would evacuate people, but that has very drastic economic impacts as well. So it's a fascinating topic, and I thank the people in, our, in my session. Yeah, I would also like to thank uh, all the speakers and the chairpersons of this session again. And we now have uh, a coffee break. And please uh, come back at uh, 11.30 for session seven, which will be on disaster response. <laughs>